Before we get started with worship, I just want to read this. It is Hebrews 4, 14. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has gone through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet with yet was without sin. Let us then approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Amen. So let's join into worship. This is um, Isaac and Bertina Bartlett. And so thank you guys so much for being here tonight. Love you guys.
Christ alone. I rock my shield, I rock my shield, my cornerstone. Oh, we say God is so good. Oh, God is so Never been 
only one like you are worthy. You are worthy. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. Sing again. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are worthy. There's never been anyone like you. Never been anyone like you. You are worthy. You are Lord Jesus, we just declare that you are worthy of all praise. We thank you, Lord God, that you, your name is exalted above all names. Anything that can be named in heaven, on earth, and under the earth, Lord Jesus, we declare you are Lord to the glory of God the Father. And we say that we worship you and we give you our, we surrender to you as all in all. We surrender to you. We declare that you are full of life. You are full of joy and love. Every good and perfect thing is in you and comes from you. And Lord God, it is our good pleasure to be your people, to belong to you, to surrender fully to you, Lord God. That is life and there is no other. And we thank you, Lord God. We thank you for bringing yourself to us, for presenting yourself to us, for receiving us, Lord God, for fellowship of what we have, Lord God, of the connection that is real, Lord God, and the eternal reward, Lord God, the unlosable eternal reward that we have with you. We thank you for that. We stand on that, Lord God. We love you so much. Thank you, Jesus. Amen and amen. Praise God. We're going to take communion. So test. Amen. Amen. We're going to take communion now, so if you can grab your elements. Um, we were all bought with this price, and then we get to accept it as our only hope of going to heaven. And um, there's something so significant about blood and how it is so spiritual, like in more than just Christianity context. If you look into blood, it like it's in a lot of crazy places <laughs> and so we shouldn't take it lightly we shouldn't take the fact that his blood was spilt for us and it's like oh, okay yeah that's a weird thing that christians do it's like no that's like this it's a spiritual thing and the devil knows it and god knows it all the angels know it. all of heaven knows it all of hell knows about blood being a supernatural way to open up heaven and earth like that is what it's used for it's used to get portals open like if you look into it it can get crazy but that's what Jesus did like it was not like just this fluke thing that he had to die it's like his body and had to be ripped open so his blood could be poured out so that we could have that portal that that connection of heaven invading earth without this we have no hope of that happening we can't hope to have any healing in our lives we can't hope to have any hope in our lives we can't hope to hear the voice of God in our everyday lives before you know Jesus did this it was such a dark time right before Jesus came and then he came and it was like bam 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 and now we can do all those things he did because of his sacrifice and because he left now we have the Holy Spirit and through this we honor Jesus and we need to stay in a place of honoring the blood and the sacrifice and not taking it for granted that's why it talks about in the Bible like search your heart you know if you have any like unforgiveness or whatever before you take it because it has power and we can't just take it flippantly like yay crackers <laughs> I mean you can't if you're a kid but when you grow up in maturity you have to start realizing the weightiness of the blood the weightiness of the broken body and that and through understanding the cross and what it did for us, we get healing. I know that there's people who preach about uh, the cross and people get healed in the room while they're preaching about it because that's the, the weight of the presence that's on the broken body and blood. And so we're gonna take this and I just pray. I feel the heaviness of just knowing and not taking it lightly of the blood of Jesus. And I hope you do too. And just take it right now. If you do have any unforgiveness in your heart, just ask really fast. It doesn't have to be, you know, you don't have to do penance for like 10 days. Like right now, it's just, okay, Jesus, forgive me for that. I am so sorry. He forgives you. 
that's what this does. And, um, and let's take it all together and just remember, this is so important. This is so important to our walk with Jesus. This is where it all started. This is where he showed his love completely and totally. And, radi- and he just, he, it was a radical form of love. And all of heaven knows its significance. So as we take this, let's just remember him. Jesus, we love you. Father God, we love you. You sent your son, your only son, that whoever believed in him would have eternal life. But he had to die. He had to die. Jesus knew that. Jesus knew he had to die. That was his purpose. So that we could be in communion with you, Father. We could lean back into your loving arms. That we could fall back onto you. So right now, we just take this with so much awe, with so much reverence of who you are, God, of Jesus, the Messiah who came so that we could be in right standing. We honor you, Jesus, and we thank you for what this means. So we just ask that as we take it, it cleanses us of all unrighteousness, inside and out, in our minds, on our tongue, in our bodies. We just ask for it to cleanse us right now in the name of Jesus. Cleanse us in the name of Jesus through the power of the blood, through the power of the bread. Right now, we take this. Ask for healing, revelation in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's take it together. Amen. Daniel. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Yeah, just during the worship, I, I don't get this too often, but I felt really clearly uh, that there's someone that's been dealing, I think for most of their life with severe migraines and it's on the right eye. And I had a picture in worship uh, when this person, I think it was like three years old and they actually fell down a slide. It was a yellow and red slide. They fell down and they hit their head really hard. And ever since this incident, They've had these reoccurring headaches and migraines. I just feel like right now that God is healing you right now, that you've had this for years, and Jesus is saying, enough is enough. And this pain, this this ailment is not your cross to, to carry anymore. Jesus already carried it on the cross. By his wounds, you're healed. So we command healing in Jesus' name, wherever you are, that even you would feel like heat on your face. Yeah, we, did, we don't have to ask our Father. We command healing. It says heal the sick. We don't have to try it. We just heal in Jesus' name. So if that's you, if that resonates, please let us know. Please, you know, comment, reply. We want to see this testimony in Jesus' name. Awesome. And I want to take up the offering And this is a time just to really respond back to the Father. This is still worship. You know, like anytime we give something that actually costs us something, that's worship. And Matthew 7, verse 1, it says, The measure you use, let it be measured back to you. And so just ask the Holy Spirit, you know, ask Him, okay, God, what do you want me to give? And you can give online. We have a... You know, we have these we normally give out, but since you guys aren't here, we have an online uh, website that you guys are already on, apparently. And just hit that button, and then, yeah, bless you guys in Jesus' name. Let me just pray over the offering. God, we thank you that you're the ultimate provider. And God, we want to just give back anything that you've already given us. And so, God, we just, we thank you for your provision. And God, we just thank you for sowing the seed. And then you promised we would reap a harvest in your name. Amen. Bless you guys. Here's Bob. Praise God. Well, welcome to uh, Sunday night church. It's great. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, preach on uh, moving forward with boldness tonight. I really feel like uh, this is a timely message. And uh, so let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you so much that you are calling the church to boldness. We thank you, Lord God, that there is a time for everything. Lord Jesus, I pray that the church has ears to hear. I pray that you'd give us ears to hear 
Lord God, we love you so much. You treat us like a shepherd leading the sheep, Lord God. And we want to hear. We want to follow you, Lord God. We want to follow you whatever field you're taking us into, Lord God. You lead us in, into places where we can feed, where, we, where it's, there's still waters and there's places for us to, um, to feed, Lord God. And we thank you for that. Jesus, you are Lord. You are going to uh, come in victory. You are going to redeem us. The soon, soon coming of the Lord is something we fully anticipate, Lord God. We know it's a reality, Lord God. We never let go of that. We always look forward to you and, and know that you are the one we, we seek for and we look for. And so we thank you for it in Jesus' name. Amen. Praise God. Awesome. Okay. Well, we have a... If you're, um, <laughs> if you're in the world, you, you've uh, realized that we have a lot of time to think about stuff. And uh, we have a lot of stuff to think about. Am I right? Let me, just, let me just start off with this analogy. You know something is healthy. Here's how you know something is healthy. You don't notice it. For example, your legs. If you go on a hike and you don't really notice your legs, you're, you got healthy legs. But if you go and you always are paying attention to them, you're always noticing them, you're always like having to favor your legs, you know, to, to get along... That is a sign that your legs are not healthy. Can I tell you this? The government, if it was healthy, we wouldn't all be thinking about the government 24-7 because it would be doing its job and it would be a healthy thing. For example, usually uh, fire departments work pretty good and you just don't think about them. But then when you need the fire department, bam, they're there like in 90 seconds. I don't know how good they are around here, but they're there when you need them. But, the, but, but you would have something to think about if, if they started to change policies and now a fireman lived in every house and he's always, you know, watching over everything you do. It'd be like, this is not right. And, it, I, and the thing about pain, like in your legs or in a system like that, is you have time to think about it. Well, what would be right? What is right? So <laughs> this gives us a lot of time to think about what would be right about. Because we're all interacting with the government 24-7 right now. When I was growing up, that wasn't the case. I, I, people just didn't think about the government that much, except for when it was time to vote. Anyway, so I just wanted to say that. This is a good time to consider what is it should be proper, what should be working. So, I, and I want to talk about the early church, because I believe that there's a huge chance that the, the, the thing could get better or the thing could get worse. And so I want to talk about the early church and what they experienced. You know, we, uh, the early church, well, we always pray for the power of the early church, you know. We want the power of the early church. And um, so we're, I want to look at what the early church prayed for. It's in Acts 4.23. This was right after Peter and John spent the night in jail, and they were told not to preach. And this is interesting, what they went back and what they prayed for after that. In Acts 4.23, on their release, Peter and John went back to their own people and reported all that the chief priests and elders had said to them. So they had had a little tussle with the government. When they had heard this, they raised their voices together in prayer to God. So this was a, during a time of persecution. And here's the question, what did the church pray for? This is an amazing thing just to ask yourself. They probably prayed for wisdom, right, or protection, or power. They didn't pray for any of those things. Listen to this, Acts 4.29. Now, Lord, consider their threats and enable your servants to speak your word with great boldness. <laughs> In the middle of trouble, they knew that what they really needed was boldness. And I'm going to say this, what the church needs is boldness. If there's ever trouble or an, an approach of, uh, of encroaching government tyranny or whatever, what the church needs is to pray the prayer that the apostles prayed, and it's a prayer for boldness because that is what these guys knew was going to change things, boldness. Boldness is going to take a miracle. You know why? Because sheep are not naturally bold. If you're a naturally bold person, then glory to God for you. But the, but the people I meet, we just, you know, Jesus called us all sheep. He said, like sheep, we've gone astray, and then we found our way back, and Jesus is a good shepherd. People, 
for the church to be bold, it's going to take a miracle. That's why we have to pray for boldness. That's why we have to ask God, God, give us boldness, because this just isn't a natural thing for us. And so that's an amazing thing. It's, we need to have boldness in our lives. There are times that we speak. There are times that we do speak. And we, need, we actually need boldness to do the very thing the church needs most. And I want to look at Ephesians 4.15. And it says this. This is what we need. This is what the church needs. It says, speaking the truth in love, we will in all things grow up into him who is the head, that is Christ. So we're supposed to speak the truth. And speaking the truth in love requires to first know the truth. Listen, there are guidelines. And it says that we, we're going to speak. Okay, so I need boldness and I need to speak. So what are you going to say? What are you just going to shout out? Hey, hey, I've got something to say. Hey, I've got something to say. That's not boldness because you're not saying anything. The first prerequisite to being able to speak with boldness is knowing what to say, is knowing the truth, basically. We have to be people that have the truth because otherwise you don't have anything to say. You can't ask for boldness and then have nothing to say. Hey, hey. I have something to say. Okay, you're really bold, but that's kind of useless. So we, first of all, have to be people that, that have the truth. And, and discernment is what I talked about last week, and that's such an important topic, to, to know what the truth is. And I just want to reiterate a few things about the truth because it's such an amazing topic, and I love it. Good, here's some good news. Starting a journey into truth is not as difficult as some people think. You can start your journey into truth right now. Because Romans 1.19 said this, since what, may, since what may be known about God is plain to them because God has made it plain to them, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made so that men are without excuse. He's saying here it's obvious, it's self-evident. The truth is self-evident. For all, and then 41, for all, I mean 21, for although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave thanks to him, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. I want, I want, I want you to know this. If you are a person who is on a journey of truth, I want you to know that the most basic truths, the place you need to start are self-evident truths. And this is one of them, that God exists. That God exists. (laughs) And look at what happens. When a person's mind is darkened with ungodliness, according to what this verse is talking about, you can know that the process started with an intentional choice. In here, they knew something, and then they acted like they didn't know it. They knew something, and then they just, their actions were like, I don't know it. And this hypocrisy is what darkened their mind. So, The journey of truth begins with self-evident truths, and people that are hungry for truth can find it. You can find it. Yes, you can. God promises you can find it. You need to base your life on your core self-evident absolutes that you have, that you know. That's, we talked about that last week, that, that having the absolute truth in your heart and starting with the very basics is great. Here's some, here's some things that I personally think are absolute basics. God is the creator. Jesus is the only way of salvation. The Bible is the word of God. These things are things that I know are absolute truths. I've come to the point where I absolutely know that these are absolute facts. And so you you build in your life on the things that you know are core, essential, self-evident facts. So Here's another thing about the truth. If we're going to be people of of truth that are going to be able to speak boldly, knowing the truth requires us to daily resist the flow of the world. Every day. The world is relentlessly serving foolishness, continually, without any end to it. Isaiah 5.20, it says, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil, who put darkness for light and light for darkness who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. It seems like the world is, like, doing this. It's like, this is is bad. I know this is bad. Oh, and then somebody comes along. No, that's not bad. That's good. It's like, what? Are you crazy? And it's like, wow. So anyway, there is a daily, relentless 
flow of foolishness that comes, that'll come from the world. And you have to resist that. That's part of holding on to the truth. And listen, we may hope that the politically correct madness will soon end, but I have got some bad news for you. <laughs> it's bad news, but then it's good news. The politically correct madness will not stop until the end of the age. And here is proof in Matthew 13, 49. Okay, so if you think all of a sudden people are going to, like, wise up, and then it's going to be, oh, we're all Christians now. It's not going to happen. Matthew 13, 49. Listen to this. This is, a, this is kind of a remarkable uh, couple verses here. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come forth, separate the wicked from among the just, and cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. I used to think that everyone, when they came and saw the glory of God, would kind of have a subdued defeat and be like, okay, I guess I was wrong. I'm going to go to hell now. And then they just kind of, in repentance, go to hell. That is not what this is saying. The wicked never stop raging against God. They are wailing and their screaming anger against God is, doesn't end even at this point, they are railing against God, even to the point of, ju of, of justice. And cast him into the furnace of fire, there will be wailing and gnashing of teeth. So, um, some people are never going to repent, ever, from this hatred of God, hatred of truth, and, and just serving themselves. And we will not be separated from the pressure of that influence until the very end when we're separate we're not separated away from those people that influence until the very end okay so <laughs> we got to decide right now that this pressure from the world's not going to stop but we are going to change yeah. and we're going to pray for boldness god give us boldness because it's time for me to stand in the truth and then speak it out and after we know the truth we are to say it out loud i'm going to show you how that's in the bible in 2 Timothy 1.7, the Amplified says this, For God did not give us a spirit of timidity or cowardice or fear. Okay? This fear is the opposite of speaking up or standing up. He didn't give us that spirit of, of fear. And so, uh, he, yeah, or timid, timidity or cowardice or fear. We don't have that from God. And so what we have is... The ability to stand up, to speak out. I want to, I want to propose something to you. What if it ends up, at the end of all things, that as Christians, our highest calling was to speak up for the truth? <laughs> and this is the reason we should overcome fear, because we need to get to the point where we speak up for the truth. I want, I want to read Ephesians 6. I want you to consider that. What if my highest calling is just to speak up for the truth? It's just to say that, to know the truth, and then just to say it out loud, to broadcast it, to say it. Ephesians 6, 13, therefore put on the full armor of God so that when the day of evil comes, you may be able to stand your ground, and after you have done everything to stand, stand firm then with the belt of truth buckled around your waist with the breastplate of righteousness in place. I believe stand firm means speak out loud. And it's not something that just happens in your heart, okay? It's something that happens in your actions and in your voice. I want you to consider an illustration. I hope this illustration makes sense to you, to you. You walk into a room, and there's two people in there, and they're talking about how Jesus was a con artist. And you hear what they're saying, and so you slip quietly out the back door before they notice that you're there. I got a question for you. Even though in your heart you, you are not accepting that conversation as valid, is your heart filled with boldness? Were you bold in that moment? Do you think back and say, I really spit in the devil's eye today. Man, I really stood up like a man of courage. Of course not. Because you know your actions revealed your heart, which was coward and not courageous. Isn't that the truth? 
1 Corinthians 16, 13. Be on guard, stand firm in the faith, be men of courage, be strong. People, if we're going to be strong, it's going to take our voice. It's going to take us standing up and saying something in the, <laughs> at the time. Jesus' high calling. I want you to consider that Jesus' high calling was to speak up for the truth. He says this in John 18, 37. Jesus answered, you are right in saying I'm a king. In fact, for this reason I was born, and for this I came into the world to testify to the truth. And so as he spoke the truth, that was the calling on his life. That is a powerful thing. That is the calling on our life too, to be a testimony of the truth, to testify of the truth. That is powerful. Listen, the enemy depends on the fact that people are scared to say what they think. I'm going to say that again. The enemy is, depends on the fact that people are scared to say what they think. Philippians 1.28 says this, without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that by God. Isn't that an amazing verse? Without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you. This is a sign to them that they will be destroyed because you're speaking the truth, and that, but that, they, that you will be saved and that by God. That's powerful. That is a powerful, powerful thing. We, are, we need to stand up for the truth. <laughs> yes. When God says speak up, now listen, this is because people start getting a crazy idea when, when you start talking about boldness. Because when God says speak up, he is not requiring you to change your audience. He's not saying that uh, usually you interact with coworkers. Now you have to interact with huge crowds. Now you have to interact with kings. He's not telling you to change your audience. He's just saying to change your speech. If all you talk to is coworkers, that's your audience, and you just change your speech with your coworkers. If all you ever talk to if, is the kids in the neighborhood, you just change your speech. You don't change your audience. It's just your speech becomes here. Here it says. Uh, let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. You don't change your audience, you just change. Here's a, here's a verse that talks about not changing your audience just because God's called you. Here it is, 1 Corinthians 7.20. Let each one remain in the same calling in which he was called. Yeah, oh, I'm just a teacher of kindergarten kids. That's... That's your audience. <laughs> That's it. Anyway, don't change your position. God's not saying... So, because it's easy to dismiss the message of boldness if you think you have to now preach to crowds. Because I, I'm just not going to preach to crowds. A lot of people will say, I'm just not going to go and preach to kings, you know, and crowds. You don't need to do that. Just be bold in the audience that God has already given you. Praise God. Now, this next verse is usually about overcoming fear, um, and we already read it, but, but I want to read it because it has in it three guidelines for what to say when we get past fear and we finally speak up, okay? And here's, once we get past fear and, and we speak up, this, these are the three guidelines for how to, what to say, how to talk. It says this, 2 Timothy 1, 7, for God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of a sound mind. And I'm going to close with these three guidelines for how we speak with boldness. We speak with power is the first thing. And here is how you speak with power. You say only what you hear the Father saying. That is power. That is like taking a hold of high voltage wire and just, and just delivering it to people. Because you're taking what the Father says and you're saying it. Okay? Um, John 12, 49, for Jesus said, I did not speak on my own accord or with my own authority, he said, but the Father who sent me commanded me what to say and how to say it. That's how you speak with power. Speak the word of God. That's how you do it. Here's the other thing, power and love. Love is this, have compassion and be motivated by, by love. I'm learning this lesson really, really good because I'm preaching with love all the time. Matthew 9, 36 says this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Compassion, loving the people, realizing they're sheep without a shepherd. It's like, oh my gosh, somebody just has to help 
steer them. This is what's needed. And so love, so you preach with authority, and you preach with love, and then also you talk with a sound mind. Be thoughtful, be reasoned, and be anchored in solid, rock-solid truths. That's how you have a sound mind in, your, in talking. Isaiah 117, learn to do, listen to this, this is great. Learn to do right, seek justice, encourage the oppressed, defend the cause of the fatherless, plead the case of the widow. Come now, let us reason together, says the Lord. Wow, to do all those things, you need to have solid reasoning. So we're going to speak, we're going to overcome fear, and then we're going to speak with power, with love, and with sound thinking, with sound mind. Praise God. That's great. That's what God's calling the church to. So let's pray. Amen. Lord Jesus, I thank you so much. I pray, Lord God, that you would prepare the church for boldness. You would prepare us for boldness, Lord God. We need it. We need it now. We always need it. And it needs to be a miracle, Lord. Work a miracle in, in us. Because this boldness is our high calling. It's what you've called us to do. It's what the church is here for, is to proclaim, testify to the truth, Lord. And so we accept that challenge. And Lord God, we say we're going to have to have a miracle of boldness to, uh, to do that, to do what you've called us to do. Help us to know the truth. Holy Spirit, lead us into all truth. That we would resist also the constant lies of the world that is pressing on us every day. We would resist those lies and we would hold fast to the truth, Lord God. I pray that we would speak up for the truth when we need to. Give us boldness with the people you've already put in our lives, Lord God. And we're thinking of them right now and we're praying for them, Lord God. Please make it possible for me to speak the gospel, the the love of God to these people that I see every day, these people that I see every week, Lord God. Help us speak with power, love, and a sound mind, Lord God. When you give us boldness, Lord God, give us the words to say and let us be with power, love, and a sound mind. We love you so much. Jesus name. We're going to we're going to end with another worship song and so let's worship the Lord during this. Shout out to God with the voice of 
Praise God. Maybe you've tuned in tonight and you're not right with God. I need, you need to hear this message. God created you to have a relationship with him, that you would be connected with him, that you would be a part of his family, that you would be his, and that he would be with you at all times. But there's sin in our lives, and that sin causes us to feel separated from God. We have guilt, and we don't know what to do about it, and we just feel separated from God. Sometimes we get the idea, a lot of times we get the idea, if I was a better person, if I tried harder, if I did good things, then I'd get rid of this guilty feeling, then I could get right with God. But listen, you could try for 100 years to do good, to, to uh, do good deeds. You would never get rid of that feeling that there's something wrong between you and God because it cannot be fixed that way, ever. That's why God sent Jesus. When Jesus died on the cross, he paid the penalty for the sin that's in your life that's causing you to feel guilty and separated from God. And this, this, uh, this salvation that Jesus paid for on the cross is a gift from God that you can never earn or deserve. It has to be received as a free gift from God. And that's the only way God does business with us is by allowing us to receive a free gift. It takes humility and it takes surrendering to God's plan of salvation. And it's a powerful thing. If that makes sense to you tonight, this is the day of salvation for you. This is when you need to put your trust in Christ as your only hope of going to heaven. Jesus is the door. Jesus is the bridge. Jesus is the one who for 4,000 years God made a plan and he took every resource and he built the bridge from heaven to earth and it was Jesus. Jesus is the bridge. There is no other. This is the way of salvation. If that makes sense to you, it's time to put your trust in Christ and you need to respond tonight. And so I want you to pray with me. If this is you, I want you to pray with me. And I want everyone to pray this out loud with me together. Say this, dear Jesus, today I receive from you this free gift of salvation. By your death and resurrection, you purchase life for me because you love me. Forgive me of my sins. Jesus, you are Lord. I trust in you. You are making me alive spiritually right now. Amen. 
If you prayed that prayer for the first time, or maybe you had slipped away from God and you, this is a recommitment of your life to the Lord, God honors this prayer. God honors this, this turning of your heart back to Him. And this is a new life for you. It's a new adventure between you and God. You need to pray because that's you talking to God. You need to read your Bible because that's God talking back to you. And let us know that you've made this decision in your life. You can contact us through the website and just know that we love you so much. So we will see you all next time. Have a blessed week. God bless you. Thanks. Thanks.